Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Bruce Buena de Mesquita, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Silver Professor of Politics at New York University. This is Bruce's third appearance on Econ Talk. We've talked about his book, The Logic of Political Survival, and today we'll talk about his forthcoming book, The Strategy of Campaigning, Lessons from Ronald Reagan and Boris Yeltsin, co-authored with Kyron Skinner, Serhi Kudelia, and Condoleezza Rice. Bruce, there are a number of fascinating themes in the book why some politicians can return from the political wilderness while others cannot, the evolution of how parties select their candidates, the strategy of campaigning, and the particular strengths and weaknesses of Ronald Reagan and Boris Yeltsin as campaigners and political strategists. Let's start with the issue of political campaigning. What's the theory of campaigning that you present in the book? Well, the the nugget in, in terms of what the theory is is there are two basic kinds of campaigners. There are campaigners who engage in rhetoric, that is, they try to persuade voters. And what they try to persuade voters about is that they are going to be better at solving the problems of the day than are the other candidates. That's the typical campaign. And then there are uh, candidates that we describe as herestheticians, a word invented by William Riker. Um, A herestetician is somebody who casts a different kind of campaign. It's somebody who argues, in essence, I'm not better at solving the problems everybody's talking about than they are. They're talking about the wrong problems. I'm going to identify what the correct problems are, and I am, by the way, the only candidate who understands that these are the problems, these are the things that need to be fixed. And by doing so, they construct a coalition of voters that no other candidate can construct. And if they're really good at it, as Boris Yeltsin was and Ronald Reagan was, they construct a coalition around a set of arguments such that their main opponent, uh, in Reagan's case in 1980, for example, Jimmy Carter, could not embrace his position without acknowledging that the four years of his presidency were a mistake and couldn't oppose the position without isolating himself by losing key members of his constituency, like the Scoop Jackson uh, Democrats. The rhetorical campaign is the standard. The, her- the heresthetical campaign is takes a certain form of genius, and not many people come by this strategy naturally. Uh, Ronald Reagan did not come by it naturally. Boris Yeltsin didn't come by it naturally. Abraham Lincoln, who was a heresthetician, did not come by it naturally. Um, when one runs a heresthetic campaign, or any campaign for that matter, there, there are some interesting things to note. First of all, people campaign on whatever set of issues they, they, they focus on. The voters are buying somebody who is going to deal with whatever issues come up. So one of the central themes in the book is, for example, that fundamental changes in foreign policy arose as a consequence of the voters' choices in Yeltsin and in uh, Reagan, although particularly in Yeltsin's case, those fundamental changes made, they, they didn't play any part in his strategic efforts to rise to high office. So you can change the world on the basis of policies that nobody looked to you for. So when we talk about foreign policy as grand strategy, this is a fundamental mistake because foreign policy is the consequence of a politician who has campaigned often on completely different things, and there may be very little continuity from one leader to the next. Anyway, that's, that's sort of the, the nutshell of what the book is about. Let me try to give an economist's perspective on these, the distinction you make between a rhetorical campaign and a heresthetical campaign. It's really a, the two different kinds of competition that often get discussed in, in economics. One type of competition is to outdo your competitor, come up with a slightly cheaper product, come up with a slightly better product. So you're in the same arena, but you're trying to deliver an improvement. But then there's a radical improvement, an innovation, uh, something that's not just a tweaking or a marginal change, 
but a something that transforms the landscape. And in this case, it's it's really what what Schumpeter focused on is creative destruction. So it it not it doesn't just compete in the standard way; it competes in this more radical way. Do you think that's a useful? I, I think that's more than useful. I think that's a a much better description than we offer in the book of, of exactly okay. that divide. That's exactly right. The the uh, rhetorical campaigner is competing in the existing market, not not redefining the market, not exhibiting some technological breakthrough or some other fundamental change, but is just competing with making the product a little better or a little bit more efficiently or what have you. And the hysterical campaigner is is the innovator who is really creating a, a new market. And, and to extend the economics metaphor a little farther, the uh, Clayton Christensen has written on the challenges of innovation for existing competitors. And one of his points is that existing successful firms often look to existing successful firms as threats, that they might outperform them, or a new firm that might do what they're doing a little bit better, but they're often blindsided by the firm that comes in and doesn't just do it a little better, but does something radically different. My favorite example, I don't think this is Christensen's, but my favorite example is the slide rule. Uh, so the slide rule, you're doing great. You have a dominant position in the market like Koifel and Esser, a firm that means something to you. And yes, means something I'm old to me. enough. <laughs> but most people are, many of our listeners are not old enough to have heard of Koifel and Esser. Or Koifel, of the slide rule. Or of the slide rule, but it was a, a primitive device. It was uh, some level of accuracy in making com computations. And you would, there were competitors, though. They didn't have a total monopoly. There were a couple other well-known firms at the time, but they were the dominant firm. And they were probably worried about the possibility that one of those firms could find a way to mark the plastic or ivory more accurately or develop a slide rule that was lighter or whatever, the, or one that had a microwave oven attached to it. <laughs> but in, in 1967, uh, Koifel and Esser allegedly, I don't know if this is true, commissioned a study of the future. A hundred years from now, what would the world be like? And they were in science with the slide rule and engineering. And the authors of this study came up with all these insights about what might come along. One of the things they didn't come up with, though, that was five years away, not a hundred years away, was the pocket calculator, yes. which didn't just make life more difficult for Koifel and Esser. It destroyed Koifel and Esser as a going concern. So one of the things that I find interesting about the book is the inability of the a opponent of the Harristhetician, of the innovator in politics, to respond. They're really, as you point out, they're kind of, between a rock and a hard place, doesn't really begin to cover it. They're stuck singing the same old song when the other guy's got a better symphony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they just, they don't know what to do. We t I, I use, again, the example of, of Carter and Reagan, or for that matter, uh, Reagan's competitors for the nomination in the Republican Party. Uh, Carter, the, the debate in terms of how to deal with the Soviet Union at the time was whether we should pursue detente, whether we should modify detente. Uh, it was all about how do you manage the Cold War relationship. And Ronald Reagan comes along and he says, well, you don't manage the Cold War relationship. There's no reason to manage the Cold War relationship. It's an immoral relationship. You win the Cold War. Well, this was inconceivable to anybody. He's talking about winning it peacefully. By the way, Ronald Reagan set out in 1963, in a memo he wrote in 1963, that the United States could win the Cold War peacefully by spending so much money on the military that the inefficient Soviet system would be compelled to choose between bankrupting the country to compete on the military dimension or giving up the ghost and recognizing that they couldn't compete and change. Uh, this is in 1963. So where'd you find that memo? Uh, Kyron Skinner, along with two of my colleagues uh, at Hoover, Annalise and Martin Anderson, edited a book a number of years ago called Reagan in His Own Hand. Right. Uh, and uh, they, they address that in that book. So here he was making a case for something that nobody was prepared to talk about. And and for Jimmy Carter, of course, there was the, the problem that here's Ronald Reagan arguing that we should win the Cold War. Carter stuck with detente, and the Soviets have invaded Afghanistan in 79 and so forth. And, and so detente is clearly not working. And he's stuck. He doesn't, there is no way out for him. Now, you, you claim in the book and, and just now that, that Reagan had this 
vision that he would win the Cold War. What is the other? You mentioned the 1963 memo. Did he campaign on that premise actively in the primary and in the in the general election? It sounds like an ex post uh, justification. No, actually, if you look back at the campaign, uh, the central themes of Reagan's campaign were that we had to cut taxes in order to stimulate growth in the economy, and that by stimulating growth in the economy, government revenue would go up, not down. The increase in revenue could, to a significant degree, be used to greatly expand the U.S. military to force the Soviets into a choice. Now, I don't believe that Ronald Reagan thought that the Cold War would end within his presidency, and technically it, it didn't. It ended a year or two after his presidency. But close enough for government Close work. enough. He, but he clearly had that in mind, and he clearly campaigned on the basis of we can win the Cold War, and he was seen as a little bit cuckoo uh, on, on that very basis. So he had the problem in the primaries that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush referred to his economics as voodoo economics. You're going to cut taxes in order to raise more revenue. It seemed a little bizarre, though Reagan pointed out that John Kennedy had done that and Warren, Warren Harding had done that. Both of them had successfully cut taxes to increase growth and produce more revenue. Uh, and then others argued that he was a warmonger because he's talking about winning the Cold War and it's the only way that they could envision winning the Cold War was through the use of military might as opposed to the burden of the cost. There's another piece of, uh, of interesting evidence with regard to Reagan uh, and, and the Cold War. Many people believe that the idea of a strategic defense initiative, what came to be known as Star Wars, was something raised by Edward Teller around 1984. It's true in, in 83 or 84 that Teller vetted it publicly. This had been a centerpiece of Reagan's thinking from at least 1976. And during the campaign, he had thought to raise it. His advisors urged him not to raise it because they thought this would alienate voters and would put him in this corner as, uh, as warmonger, as, as, as aggressive. So he didn't raise it in the campaign. In the 1980 campaign. In the 1980 campaign. He got Ed Teller <laughs> to raise it after he became president to see how it would play out. Smart. And interestingly, with regard to uh, Star Wars, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan presumably knew even less physics than you or I know, which isn't much. Uh, so Speak I'm, for yourself. Yeah, so I'm sure he had not a clue as to whether this was technically feasible. But he seems to have thought that if we spend a lot of money on it, this will be a signal, in game theory terms, a costly signal to the Soviets that we know how to do it, in which case they would be compelled to, try to either well. invest in it or find a way to resolve the, the issues that led us to do so. So let's back up now to the, some of the general principles you talk about in the book. Um, the whole idea of a campaign is a little bit strange, as you point out uh, in the book. The voters are aware that politicians are talking about things that they really don't have much ability to enforce, promises that are not particularly credible. Uh, why do they work at all? Talk about both these two types of campaigns, the rhetorical and the hairesthetic. Why do we take them seriously? Some of us don't, incidentally. Yes. Many of us do not. But, but you, you're quite open in the book about the role of, of campaigns as manipulative uh, exercises. So, so give us the, some of the general background. This is a, a very important question and a very important issue, uh, which not enough people have, have thought adequately about, in my view. So to rephrase the puzzle, the puzzle is why do voters change their views in response to what candidates say in a campaign when the voters know that the candidate has the incentive to say whatever it is that will persuade voters to vote for them? Why would voters pay attention to that? There's, there are arguments that they don't, but there, right. there's One also... One view is it's just entertainment, but, but surveys do suggest that people do change their minds. Yeah, and, and, and putting on the economist hat, an awful lot of money is spent on campaigns, so somebody believes that this must affect decisions. It's a very expensive form of entertainment, and it's not that entertaining. It not is true. That. Only, you know, it's a little bit like um, curling in the Olympics. You know, there is a small group that's passionate about yes. it, 
who follow its every move. But most people view, don't. It's not the national pastime, despite that we pay attention. We pay attention for more reasons than it's just entertainment. You could buy a better show for a lot less yeah. money. So, so uh, one of the ways that campaigns, particularly rhetorical campaigns, persuade voters is through negative campaigning. And while people bemoan negative campaigning, the reason negative campaigning exists is because it works. So in the book, we, we talk quite a lot about negative campaigning and we, we cast it in its historical context. And that historical context is itself rather interesting. Uh, one of the great consuls of Rome was the great orator, Cicero. Now, Cicero did not come from a high-ranking family, so for him to become consul was a very, very challenging accomplishment. When he decided to pursue the consulship, his brother, Quintus Tullius, helped him out. His brother wrote what today we might call a brochure. And this brochure was laying out the, the strategy of campaigning circa 2,000 years ago. And the strategy that, that Quintus Tullius laid out for Cicero was, look, you want people to like what you think and to like you. So wherever you go, be sure to say what you believe the audience wants to hear. It doesn't have to be true. It just has to be what they want to, be, want to hear. And by the way, of course, your opponents are going to try to do the same thing. So you have to make sure that the crowd is worried about your opponents. So be sure to talk about their sexual depravity. Be sure to talk about what evil people are. they are, how corrupt they are. It's true you can't prove these things, but the crowd will wonder, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not, but maybe it's true. It's enough to cast doubt. And that is the nature of campaigns. It is the nature of the modern campaign. What is the voter persuaded about? In part, the voter is persuaded that, well, if I go for this other person, it may be even worse than this guy. This, this was the, the core of uh, Riker's work on campaigning, in which he talked about the American Constitutional Convention. This was the core of uh, the Yeltsin campaigns, Reagan campaigns, Nixon campaign, Kennedy campaign. Thomas Jefferson campaign. Tom, oh, yes, and on and on. It was always about you better worry, that other guy is really dangerous. You don't know what I'm going to do because I'm not in office. So I'm the devil you don't know, but that's better than the devil, you do, you, the devil you do know because that guy is doing really terrible things. You better get rid of him. It's fear of, uh, of disaster. Well, what's clever about it, of course, is that it exploits the inherent uncertainty that's at the heart of the campaign. You can't, you don't know, every product that we buy, we don't know quite what we're going to get. But it's... Ironically, we may know a lot more about the cars that we buy than we know about the politicians we're going to elect. You know, we have a track record of a senator. Interestingly, very few senators get elected president, uh, despite we know a reasonable amount about them in a national context. Governors have an easier chance in recent years, maybe partly because, well, just it's strange that that uncertainty in both situations, it really demands a negative campaign. Now, the key to it, I think, uh, is an idea that started out as what's called Minimax regret and morphed into a uh, more detailed theory of decision making under particular circumstances uh, that led to a Nobel Prize for uh, Danny Kahneman. It was worked by Kahneman and his uh, colleague who uh, passed away, uh, Amos Tversky, where through experiments they observed that people were more concerned about avoiding losses than they were about gain. So if you put people in a circumstance where they stood to lose a certain amount of money or to gain a certain amount of money, they were much more cautious about protecting against losing that money, which they already had, than gaining money they didn't have, even though its value was the same. And so the negative campaign capitalizes on that. It is, you, it is to create fear. You have something, and if you vote for this other guy, you're going to lose it. If you vote for me, there's less chance that you will lose it. That's the heart of what a negative campaign is. And, and negative campaigning is really at the core of rhetorical campaigns. In a heresthetic campaign, there's also negative campaigning, but it's, a, it's of a, in a sense, more positive sort. It's positive in the following sense. It is not arguing this other guy doesn't know how to do things. 
but rather this other guy may know how to do what he's talking about. He's talking about the wrong stuff. It's not what we want him to do. It's not yeah. what he, yeah, it's the wrong issues. He has not caught on to what the real problems are. So sure, you can go over there. That guy's going to look under the lamppost where it's all lit up brightly, and he's going to make sure the light bulb doesn't burn out. But there's nothing happening under that light bulb. It's, it's happening someplace else. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm more competent at figuring out what the problems are. He might be very good at solving the problems he's addressed, but they're the wrong problems. Or they're trivial, or they're not yeah. worth solving. or yeah. Yeah. Maintaining detente. Not the right problem. We'll come to that in a second. I just want to stop for a minute and stick with this, um, the negative campaigning. I, I find it fascinating, um, the perennial complaints about negative campaigning, which, of course, the negative campaigning continues, and negative campaigns continue to be successful. Uh, you make another similar observation in the book, which, which I liked, which is that there's always this romance about principled politicians. Uh, we find them on the campaign trail. We rarely find them in office. So while we claim to want principled politicians, it evidently is not a winning strategy for most candidates. Why is that? Yeah. Well, we say we want principled politicians. What that really means is we want politicians who agree with us. Yeah. So, for example, a substantial majority of the American public does not seem very happy with President Bush or with Vice President Cheney. And they'd like to say that these pe people say, though, they're evil, they're this, they're that, and the other. Uh, I believe they're both very principled men. It's just not very many people agree with their principles. Correct. Uh, they believe that they are doing the right thing in Iraq. They believe that in the long run, if we stay the course, that will be proven to be so. Uh, I happen to think they're mistaken, as do most people. We don't, so people don't like but no them. one admires them. Yeah, nobody says, wow, these are people who believe in what they are doing. They say they're, they're stubborn. They don't listen to other people. Well, yeah, because they are principled. Yeah. If you have principles, you stick by them. Well, so what, what I think goes on with the big problem which in, in campaigning, the thing that leads to negative campaigning, is what people say they want principled candidates. What they really want is people who agree with them. Candidates understand that, but candidates understand that what agrees with somebody, it's exactly what Quintus Tullius advised, differs. So if I'm speaking to one person, they want to hear that uh, the Iraq war is a, is a good thing, advancing democracy is a good thing, and talk to another person, they want to hear that the Iraq war is a terrible mistake, and Iraq is no place to advance democracy. The candidates realize that, so therefore the candidates have an incentive not to be clear about Positions. Yeah, as you point out in the book, it's not that we, when, we, when we're cynical about politicians, it's not that they say over here at this speech, the Iraq war is the greatest crusade of, of wonder, wonderfulness in human history. And in the other audience, they say it's a horrible mistake. It's worse than, uh, than Hitler. It's that in the right place, at the right time, they shade their words. So you, you say it nicely in the book. They tell the whole truth. They don't they tell, tell the, the whole truth, truth, but not the whole truth. Right. Because the whole truth will not get you elected. And that's what campaigning is about. It is about winning. It's, you know, I mean, there are candidates who run with no expectation of winning, and, and, and they are fulfilled in their expectations because they, they, they say what they believe and they don't get elected. You give the example of Ralph Nader in the book. You give the example of, uh, is, it, is it Norman Thomas? Norman Thomas. Who's a great an example, an important person in American history that most of us have never heard of. He's the head of the Socialist Party, is that correct? Yes, he was the founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. He was probably the first person in the United States to argue vigorously for Social Security legislation, to vote, uh, argue for uh, equal rights for African Americans, for all Americans. And if we look at many of the policies... And he ran for president. And he ran for president, quite unsuccessfully. Yes. Uh, he... he he was not a practical politician, but if we if we look at some of the major policy innovations of the last several decades in the United States, the New Deal, whether one was happy with it or not, big innovation, the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson, the programs that these folks were implementing were the ideas of Norman Thomas that got him relegated to, at best, a footnote in American history, because he did not understand how you campaign to win, or he didn't care to win. That's the other possibility. Yeah. 
and you can influence you can influence history without being president, obviously. Um, one more comment and thought on Reagan, though, on, on this principled issue and, and our romance with being principled. When Reagan died, I was uh, stunned to find out that he was a, a man of great principle. Uh, people on the left and the right uh, praised him endlessly for his, his unwavering principles, his support for this and that. My memory of Ronald Reagan, he was compromised on many, many things, as all successful politicians have to do. After he was dead, uh, people <laughs> romanced his, he, he talked romantically about how principled he was. Many of those people hated his guts when he was alive, hated the principles that he did hold, and encouraged him to act against his principles, which he did many times, if he indeed had some. And I think he did. But <laughs> well, I think he had some core principles that he stuck by, and he had other principles that were not so core. And, yeah, uh, a he, more malleable. Yeah, uh, really. He believed deeply in uh, Star Wars as a vehicle for forcing the Soviets into a spending oblivion, but he didn't raise it in the campaign. So if we, if we look at his campaigns, he told the truth, but he didn't tell the whole truth. And if we look at him earlier, we, as we do in the book, we look at his uh, mostly forgotten 1968 campaign for the Republican nomination, as well as his 76 campaign. In, in 1968, Reagan ran on a strategy that one would have to describe as a Southern strategy that had the characteristic of appealing through code words uh, to many racist sentiments. He was not a racist, but that was a constituency he needed. In the 1980 campaign, uh, he won the uh, pro-choice vote. Carter won the pro-life vote. But after 1980, Reagan spoke a lot about uh, an, an anti-abortion, pro-life policy. He didn't do much about it. Didn't do it. much. Didn't. No, he, he played to his constituency very, very successfully. I think all the people who voted, many of the people who voted for him saw him as a great supporter of uh, being pro-life and yet uh, pro uh, anti-abortion and yet didn't do much. <laughs> didn't do much didn't raise it much in the 1980 campaign and played a much bigger part in the 1984 campaign um, because it wasn't a convenient issue for him in 1980, though he was forging uh, a coalition which is the dominant coalition now in the Republican Party, is, although I think Ronald Reagan was primarily a libertarian in his own outlook. The coalition that he built and the insight that he had in 1977 was that there were two types of conservatives in the United States, and the Republicans were only getting votes from one of those two types. One type were the fiscal conservatives who voted Republican, and they tended to be sympathetic to big business and so forth. The other type, as he identified in a speech he gave uh, on January 15th, 1977, before Carter was inaugurated, the other type were people who voted Democrat. And these were blue-collar workers, uh, people who had a set of socially conservative values but disliked big business and, and could not imagine themselves being Republican. He carved out a niche for them in the Republican Party. And he took the labor vote as a result in 1980, and he took the Catholic vote, and he took these major Democratic constituencies by creating this socially conservative coalition, which is the uh, bedrock now of the Republican Party's constituency. A constituency that uh, may be falling, a coalition that, that appears to be falling apart in this coming election. There doesn't seem to be a, a candidate in that mold. I don't mean in the charisma mold, but just in terms of the positions that are being staked out. Uh, Fred Thompson probably right. He's is. the only one. Uh, the, I think the, the, what is happening is that now, uh, a quarter of, more than a quarter of a century later, it has run its course. And the party recognizes that they are now encountering a problem that is similar to the problem the Democrats have had for the last few decades, at least since the McGovern reforms. And that is that to win the nomination, you have to run towards uh, the extremes rather than the center. And to win the presidency, of course, you have to run to the center. So the, the, val the social values coalition uh, has led to a reliance on a Christian right and so forth, whose views don't resonate that well with the centrist voters. 
in much the same way that the very liberal views that dominate uh, in the activist part of the Democratic Party don't run that well in the mainstream election. But let's talk about that primary process because there's a plays an important role in, in the analysis in the book. Uh, traditionally in American politics, and, and this is the term you use, the smoke-filled room played an important role in selecting political candidates for office. And that's a, a code, that's a, a, a metaphor for the party insiders, a small group of, of insiders made the decision about who would represent the party. That changed, and I'm curious, I, I don't know if you talk about this in the book, I don't remember, why did that change, first of all, and then what were the implications of that change for, for the political campaigns that you talk about in the book? Well, this is an important question, and I do want to remind you and your listeners about Boris Yeltsin, who is more important in this change in the Russian context. We'll come back. I want to come, we'll come uh, to so, Yeltsin. Um, but, but in America, the, 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 the role, you know, for anybody under the age of, of 35 or 40, the, the primaries are everything. Yes. Uh, if you have a little knowledge of history or you're old enough to remember, um, Primaries were not decisive. In today's world, the primaries are decisive, and the convention is essentially a, a media so, event to stoke support. Right. It's entertainment. It's entertain pure entertainment. Um, and it that was, was not always the case. It was so, not so entertainment uh, in the late 60s. By the mid-70s, the tide had turned. In part, this was a response to the huge social upheavals of the late 60s, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, which empowered constituencies that had previously not been empowered, uh, and uh, candidates found ways to work their way around the smoke-filled room and leave the party leaders more isolated than that had been true before. Um, and as a result, the, cir the circumstances and system changed. If we look at the 1968 Republican campaign, during the uh, primary season, or before, and even before, the key candidates for president were, of course, Richard Nixon, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, representing the liberal wing of the party, and before Rockefeller stepped in, uh, George Romney, Mitt Romney's father. George Romney was considered the front runner uh, in 67. Uh, and then Ronald Reagan also attempted to run a campaign, though he would say he never made it to, certainly never made it to front runner status. On the other hand, uh, Time Magazine did a cover of uh, Reagan and Rockefeller as the, the two, two voices to yeah. beat. Um, the thing that was interesting structurally about 68 compared to later, in 68 primaries were not important, there were what we refer to in the book as a set of barons in the Republican Party, Strom Thurmond, uh, Everett Dirksen, Barry Goldwater, John Towers, and so forth. This handful of people, about six of them, controlled something on the order of 40% of the delegates. So, so when you say primaries didn't matter, they mattered some, but they were not decisive in choosing delegates the way they are today. That's, that's the, right. The delegates right. were not chosen primarily through a party primary process state by state. There were a few states that chose by primaries. Most states, the party leadership chose who the delegates to the convention were. And you got chosen if you were loyal to sure. one of the barons. And well, the barons must have liked that system. They, it probably they, induced a lot of love they, and they, affection from, they, the, from the rank and they, file. They loved that system, and they took care of the rank and file to try to keep the rank and file loyal. Their problem was that events swamped it so that there was this new rank and file who were not beholden to them as a result of the expanded constituencies and so forth. In any event, uh, one of the things that Nelson Rockefeller did not understand, that George Romney did not understand, and that Ronald Reagan did not understand in 1968, was that a grassroots campaign was almost certainly doomed to fail to win a majority of delegates, because when six people controlled 40% of the delegates, you had to put together the remainder for you when there were multiple people competing for them. Richard Nixon understood, I need these six guys. If these six guys, I'm these 40, six barons I'm support 80% me, of the way home. I'm 80% of the way home. 40 yeah. of the 50% I need. And, and it's pretty easy to pick up that margin. But George Romney, Nelson Rockefeller, 
to some extent, Ronald Reagan, who was, to the extent he was active in that campaign, they're not stupid. Why did they run grassroots campaigns? I mean, Richard Nixon is famous for being a strategic Machiavellian kind of guy. He understood it. Why, why didn't they? Well, I think Rockefeller... Did they have a choice? Yeah, Were they able to run well, such a campaign? Rockefeller understood it. He couldn't run such a campaign because he had carved out a policy smaller, stance yeah. that there was no way in the world these folks were going to support. Uh, George Romney had the same problem. Ronald Reagan uh, came into the race late, and he was basically competing for the same constituency that Richard Nixon was competing for. And Nixon had done a very good job of lining these folks up and making deals with them. Before Reagan was reluctant to commit, and by the time he committed, the, the delegates were pretty much signed up. Okay. So that was the 68 campaign. After that, certainly with 72 in the Democratic Party, and uh, well, 72 was, uh, Nixon was an incumbent president, so 76 was the next highly contested Republican nomination. Things had changed. The smoke-filled room, the party barons, the insiders didn't have as much say. You could run a grassroots campaign, and that changed things, correct? Yes, right. And Ronald Reagan ran an intense campaign to uh, wrest the nomination away from the incumbent president, uh, Gerald Ford. And Ford did many things to help Ronald Reagan. He pardoned Richard Nixon and so forth. Um, Reagan came very close, very close, to, very being close to being successful. And Ford engaged in a number of maneuvers to try to co-opt Reagan, uh, offered him cabinet post, uh, would talk about his being uh, Ford's vice presidential nominee. That got thwarted. Um, Reagan had no interest, among other things. Uh, and Reagan very early on announced who his vice presidential nominee would be, trying to force Ford to do the same. <laughs> things didn't work out. But in any event, he got, he got very, very close. As we point out in the book, it's extremely difficult to wrest the nomination within, your, within the party from the president when the president is a member of your party and can run again. The last time that a uh, presidential incumbent sought the nomination of his party and to, for re-election and actively sought it and failed to get it was the great Franklin Pierce. Uh, oh yes, the Pierce years. <laughs> yes, I remember the those. Pierce years. Uh, well, it's a, really a, it's an example I hadn't thought about. It's really an example of the power of incumbency and the, the, the power that the devil that you know can, can exert in a political campaign, right? You have high name recognition when you're the president. It's a big starting advantage. Well, and, and Reagan and Ford were not that far apart in policy ideas, so and Reagan had not yet worked out or had not yet articulated his heresthetic strategy, um, so he he didn't find a way to box Ford in, and he was kind of torn between, on the one hand, wanting the nomination, on the other hand, not wanting to be too negative towards Ford because he was worried about the alternative to Ford in the Democratic Party. Well, and if you lose, uh, what is it if you? If you uh, strike the king, make sure it's a lethal blow. If, if you make a neg run a negative campaign against Ford and you don't beat him, you've hurt your chances of running again, which, of course, he was able to run again, and he yes. did win. Uh, and he was very mindful that uh, there was the risk of his being put in the position that Rockefeller found himself in in 1968. In the 64 campaign, Rockefeller stayed home rather than campaign for Barry Goldwater. This was not lost on the leadership of the Republican Party, who felt that he wasn't loyal. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan was very worried about that. He was very worried not to be seen as having created a, a mortal blow to the party and not wanting to be seen as somebody sure. who was disloyal. Before we go on to Yeltsin, I want to ask one more question about this uh, shift in um, prime and the way that... The the parties choose their nominees. A lot of people bemoan the fact that there's very little variety within parties today. Uh, you mentioned the name of Scoop Jackson. Some of our listeners may not know, remember that name but, or know that name. He was a hawkish Democrat 
in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller also may not be well known to some of our listeners. He was a liberal Republican. A liberal Republican who, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, believed, along with advice from Henry Kissinger, who was a close aide of his, that he, that he Nelson Rockefeller, could win the votes of the Bobby Kennedy supporters. Right, and that's not inconceivable a plausible, today. Inconceivable today. Uh, let's not discuss whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I'm agnostic about it. I think the, the media seems to bemoan it, but uh, it's definitely true that the, cons the Democratic Party is and the Republican Party are each uh, much. Uh, more monolithic than they were in past times. Does that primary thing have anything to do with that? Yeah, I think so. I, I, and having said that, by the way, Rudy Giuliani is the closest thing to a liberal Republican we've seen in a while, <laughs> and he's making a serious run at the, at the, at the nomination. So it's maybe yes, something but, has changed. But, but, he also, but he also went to Alabama and said that the Alabama state government should have the right to fly the Confederate flag over the Alabama State House. Whether they should or should not, it wasn't an issue in Alabama, so he was not. <laughs> Not that, being discussed there, so he wasn't running to the center of the party. Yeah. Um, interesting. Uh, should we bemoan this? I, I don't know. Um, it's. I believe it's a fundamental change due to the primary system. I'm not an expert on American voting, uh, so I say this speculatively. Uh, I think what is true is that the primary system brings out activists. And uh, voter turnout is low in general. Voter turnout is much lower in primary elections than it is in national elections. All right, it brings out the, the most interested voters. Yeah, the, the people who, who have a, the strongest point of view. Uh, and those folks tend not to be towards the center of things. So the parties become less Tweedledee and Tweedledum and more differentiated. Uh, and then, of course, when one runs for, if you get the nomination, you run for office, then you try to become Tweedledee and Tweedledum <laughs> again because... <laughs> that's where the votes are. That's where the votes are. Yeah, and you, you're going to run where the votes are. But the, but the point of the book, which, which I like, uh, which, which is surprising, I think, to some people, would be surprising to some people, is that as you identify in the book, there's a lot of literature in, in both economics and political science about the virtues of running in the center. Um, you focus on two candidates who are not centrist, who yes. manage, despite their lack of, of being central to the, or being like the median voter, or most voters, were still managed to overcome that. And they didn't overcome it by hiding who they were. It's not that they ran to the right or the left, got the nomination, ran to the center during the main campaign. They stayed where they were in the main campaign, more or less. Obviously, they tweaked as yeah, you yeah, say. Yeah. So talk about that. Well, so they, they both, Yeltsin and Reagan, redefined, so to speak, what the center is. Uh, by linking issues, the original motivating question behind this book was a question that Condi Rice posed to me and, and to my co-authors to begin with, uh, which is how is it that people like Yeltsin or Reagan, who seem to be far out of the mainstream politically of their society, can rise to the highest office. And we're in the wilderness. And in we're absolutely political wilderness in the, in in the wilderness. Yep. Uh, Reagan had two prior failed efforts to get the nomination. Many people thought he was finished. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, much worse. I mean, he had. He, he had. <laughs> been, lucky he was alive. He was lucky he was alive, <laughs> as, as we quote in the book. At one point, Gorbachev, uh, he quotes Gorbachev as saying that uh, they, they have to deal with Yeltsin by whatever means, and Yeltsin speculates, does this mean a bullet to the head? And in the Soviet history, that's exactly what it would have meant. Uh, so how do they do it? Well, that's where heresthetics comes in. So you link issues in a, this creative, innovative, entrepreneurial way that redefines the landscape, and it defines it not on a left-right continuum, but on multiple dimensions. And when you move into multiple dimensions, being far from the status quo makes it easier to put a coalition of supporters together than being close to it. We have some nice little figures in the book that illustrate this, and it's a little hard to, to e explain that without the pictures. Uh, but that's the essence, that if you can link issues strategically, then you can create a space where there can be a coalition where before that space didn't exist. 
For Boris Yeltsin, this was a, an even more challenging problem than for Ronald Reagan, because Boris Yeltsin had not only to create that space, he had to create an electorate that could fill that space. He had to change the system. Talk he about Yeltsin. Tell the system. Us, talk about Yeltsin's uh, creativity and the, and the challenge he faced uh, before he was successful. So Boris Yeltsin, uh, in his first effort to rise to a high political office, uh, when he was made a candidate member of the Soviet Politburo, launched a campaign uh, against the special privileges of Communist Party members. That was very popular with the general population, very unpopular, <laughs> shockingly, to those who were getting the special privileges who were the decision makers who chose who the leaders were. Now, was, was he investing in the future there or just speak in his mind? What did he have in mind uh, with that? I, I don't, that seems a rather, uh, <laughs> it's a bizarre strategy. It's like a, a, a bankrupt strategy. Well, in turned his, out to pay out for him, paid it, off for him it, ultimately, but it, at the time. In his defense, so his, his primary, or Gorbachev's primary rival on the other side, on the cons more conservative side, was a man named Ligachev. Uh, and Ligachev's campaign was to reduce the availability of vodka and other alcohol in uh, the Soviet Union. This was neither popular with the general population, nor with the yeah. leadership, all of whom were consuming vast quantities of vodka. Maybe he was confused about what the idea of an election was. Maybe well, he thought the idea, we thought it was like golf, the lowest total wins. Yes. He may have, well, these were clearly people there. who had not sorted out how, how, how this operated. Uh, in Yeltsin's case, I think it was naivete. I, I, I think he believed that Gorbachev was a real reformer. And that, he, and that Gorbachev would see this as part of perestroika. Uh, whereas, of course, Gorbachev understood this would be the death knell for him politically if he went along with banning privileges. So, of course, Gorbachev denied that there were any privileges. Right. He didn't say that, that it was a good idea for people to get privileges. He just said there weren't any. Yeah, there weren't any. <laughs> in a Soviet system, in the, not possible in a socialist society. Um, so for his uh, efforts, uh, Yeltsin got dropped as a candidate member of the Politburo when everybody else who was elevated from candidate member to full member by Gorbachev, everybody that, that Gorbachev had brought in was elevated except uh, Yeltsin. Yeltsin was instead fired. <laughs> and in the way the Soviet system worked, this pretty much meant the end of one's career in politics. Sure. He was lucky to be alive. And yet he resurrected himself. And he resurrected himself by having a profound insight of how he could link his anti-privileges uh, campaign to another campaign, Autonomous Russia, in such a way that he could win over the very people who were keeping him out of power, isolate Gorbachev, and create a new environment, a new institutional environment in which he could win office. So the Russian argument in a nutshell was Russia is producing the vast majority of the wealth of the Soviet Union. It is subsidizing what he liked to refer to as the colonies, the rest of the Soviet republics. Why are we doing this? And he points out that Russia is the only Russian, only Soviet Republic that doesn't have its own Communist Party. There's a Georgian Communist Party, an Azerbaijan Communist Party, an Uzbek Communist Party, but not... And there's a Soviet Union Communist yes, Party, but Russia... But not a Russian Communist Party. And the reason was, of course, that it, in the past, it didn't need one. It didn't was, need it. the it Soviet was, Union it, was the Russian was, Communist yeah. Party. So he, he draws this distinction, which is clearly a move towards Russian sovereignty. Now, Gorbachev obviously can't embrace this, because if, if Russia is sovereign and is deciding, so Yeltsin's idea is Russia will decide everything for Russia except foreign policy. That'll be the domain of the Soviet government. If Gorbachev goes along with that, he is the titular head of an empty shell. He's, he no longer has the budget. He no longer has any power. But the, the nomenclatura, the Communist Party uh, leadership in the bureaucracy, most of them are Russian. Oh, they think, in Russia, we will have control over more of the money than we have in the Soviet system, because we have to share it around. And we will have more political power, because we don't, won't have to share it around with Georgians and Uzbeks and so forth. 
And so they begin to see this as attractive. Yeltsin then starts to push for elections. And Gorbachev has boxed himself in. He's, he's very popular at this time. So he sees this as the vehicle. Uh, that, that, yeah, okay, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and others are talking about elections. I could do that. That will be good for me. And, and it is good for him, except so that they're local elections and not national elections. Uh, Yeltsin gets elected mayor of Moscow. Now, and he's get, he wins with 90% of the vote. So suddenly he has the claim of, of actually representing the proletariat. Very hard to argue against in a, in a system that is pretending to be the dictatorship of the proletariat. Very hard to argue, oh, what's this guy talking about? So, well, so, you could argue it. But well, you it could. It's hard, but it could be done. Yeah, so, Gorbachev, so what happened? Gorbachev turns out to be too nice a guy. So he's kind of stuck with it. Uh, this leads eventually to Yeltsin's ascent to back into national politics and pushing for this Russian idea. He creates a general electorate in Russia, and now Gorbachev is really stuck. And there's no way that Gorbachev can resist this. So he's, he's trying... I'm Gor confused. Help me under. So, so Yeltsin is agitating at the national level, level, excuse me, at the national level for a Russian Communist Party that would have sway over Russian issues. And he gets that. It gets that in what dimension? The, the Russian the, Communist Party. It's a Russian party, it, it, and, and now within this Russian party context, he is essentially the the boss of Russia, and so now he he begins to negotiate with Gorbachev to redefine responsibilities, and Gorbachev has no way to defeat that short of using military force, which he's reluctant to do. This is one of many of the elements that led to the coup against. Gorbachev, because here is this guy, Yeltsin, heading this Russian government, saying it's okay for the Baltic republics to secede, the Russians could do the same, the Soviet constitution allows for secession, and Gorbachev on the one hand is saying, well, yes, the constitution does allow for this, but it doesn't have this in mind, and he's talking, he sends troops into the Baltic republics, and Yeltsin denounces it. And he, he urges Russian soldiers not to go, not no. to follow orders. So, but what was other than the prestige that he held as mayor of Moscow? What political power did Yeltsin have at that point? That's what I'm confused. Well, about. so he's he, there's a Russia now, and he's the head of the Russian party. There's a, a there is now this Russian semi-autonomous entity. Which, so, which was, is real before it was just the Soviet. So the Russian Communist Party, did they have privileges or no privileges? Ah, I don't know the answer to that. The, the, the interim was not very long. My guess is there were privileges. There were arguments that Yeltsin was still consuming privileges. Uh, surely the nomenclatura had privileges who went along with him, though they would have been cast differently. The privileges campaign was argued in the context of when the people can choose, privileges will disappear because the people, of course, won't support privileges. And ultimately, that's sort of what happens. What you're fundamentally arguing is, is that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a political innovation by Boris Yeltsin to freeze out Gorbachev. Is that, yes, is that yes, accurate? He, yes, he, he didn't envision... Uh, Cold War end. He, Who's know, he? Yeltsin. This was not, that was not on his agenda. Uh, at some level, I'm not even sure that he envisioned the collapse of the Soviet Union. What he envisioned was the creation of a political entity, Russia, that he could run. And he could be an important figure, and he could be at least equal to Gorbachev. So he got much more, I think, than he anticipated. And uh, sadly, he wasn't very good at uh, governing, but he was very good at constructing a campaign that, that produced this outcome. It changed the institutional arrangements so that he could rise to power, and he changed the fundamental uh, way that the world worked as a byproduct of his political maneuvering simply to, to be a, a more powerful guy than he otherwise would have been. Do you think political forces would have pushed the Soviet Union in that direction anyway? Not nearly so quickly. Certainly, the the Reagan military spending was bringing the Russian, the Soviet economy, uh, to uh, a critical juncture. But I think that the uh, they would have muddled through that had there not at the same time been a Yeltsin. Uh, 
Uh, one of the nice things, in my view, uh, in, in terms of this book, is there's a foreword by George Shultz, who was, of course, Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan. And in the foreword, one of the things that uh, George Shultz observes is that although he was there, actively engaged, until, until reading the detailed account of Yeltsin, he had not understood how critical Yeltsin was to the end of the Cold War and how central the Russian idea was to Gorbachev's defeat. Um, and as I say, this was something that Yeltsin engaged in for personal political gain. It, he didn't have some grand vision of the world. He had a grand vision of Boris Yeltsin. Why did Gorbachev, you don't talk as much about Gorbachev, why did he choose those, the path of reform that he, reform that he did? So in an unrelated publication, uh, I, I've looked at the end of the Cold War in the context of, of exactly this question. Uh, when because Gor he put in motion absolutely. his own political demise. Ab absolutely. Um, and one view is that he was a noble man who wanted to make the world a better place, and he saw that communism was evil and unsuccessful, and he thought, let's move toward a different society. That would not be my view. I was going to say, it just strikes me that you probably have a different yeah, view, that, so that I'd like to hear it. Not, not my account. So uh, I talked a little bit about linkage as a way of uh, putting together a coalition. Uh, the analyses I've done on this particular question suggest that Gorbachev attempted two reforms that he thought would solidify his hold on power. One was modest economic reform, nothing remotely like what Yeltsin wanted. Uh, and that economic reform was intended to loosen things up enough to generate enough growth to sustain the system and himself. And the other related to that was that he needed help in getting his economy moving, and he thought the West could help him. And he was willing to dangle concessions on foreign policy, greater detente, in exchange for foreign economic assistance. He was looking for money to infuse his, uh, his economy with and, and get things moving. The miscalculation that I believe he made, and I, I've, I've modeled this, was to believe that the economic reforms would stimulate, uh, a, a, and the loosening of foreign uh, ties, and would, 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 would stimulate this largesse, and solidify his position. What it did is it strengthened Yeltsin's hand for still more economic reform and got the international community to be acting as a constraint on the maneuvers that Gorbachev could engage in because he was now alienating the Ligachev conservative end of his coalition. So Gorbachev made some bad calculations. He did not foresee that these changes would alienate the conservative side of the party. He thought they would understand this is what we have to do. And he, and he did not understand that Yeltsin had the skills to capitalize on this and improve his constituency. I would think if there was anybody that Gorbachev had worried about at that stage, it was Shevardnadze. And he did a pretty good job of co-opting Shevardnadze. So he found himself having, in my view, launched a policy that he thought was going to consolidate his hold on power that had exactly the opposite effect. It, it, it was bad calculation on his part. Early in our interview, you mentioned that a lot of times a campaign will raise issues that turn out not to be important in governance, but highlight the creativity or the actual stand of the politician or just give him an edge in the political struggle. But Reagan ran on a political set of issues that he did implement. Yes. And you're suggesting that, and you think history will judge that, that innovation, which put him into power in 1980 as President of the United States, the promise to link tax cuts, an expanded federal budget, but expanded in military spending rather than social spending, to challenge the Soviet Union's uh, equality as a sparring partner in the Cold War, actually was implemented and played the decisive role in boxing Gorbachev in in those and forced him to miscalculate, make those reforms, and led to the end of the Soviet Union. Played a, a very important role. I don't want to say decisive because if we took Yeltsin out of the picture, it would not have been decisive. Mm -hmm. The the Reagan strategy, and that's 
one of the centerpieces of the book. The Reagan strategy was necessary. It wasn't sufficient. He had also to have somebody like Yeltsin, who was certainly not a person of Reagan's construction, who was providing this alternative anchor in the Russian setting. Yeah, that's that would, very interesting. Uh, so it was the confluence of those two things, I think, that was, that, that was both necessary and sufficient to bring down the Soviets. Any advice for, uh, you mentioned George Shultz. I think in the foreword he mentions the, that the book would be useful to, to campaigners. It is also useful to us as the viewers of campaigns. Any advice for us as, as viewers other than cynicism, skepticism? Yeah, I do have a piece of advice. Um, my, my, my advice is that uh, what people should look for is the quality of the mind when a candidate is confronted with an unanticipated question. How do they handle the response? How quickly do they slide back to the Quintus Tullius advice of denouncing the opponents uh, and giving their stump speech. Oh, it's very interesting you ask about balancing the budget. Let me respond by talking about the war in Iraq, you know, that sort of thing. As, or, or the person who actually responds and you see the quality of mind because they're caught with a question they hadn't anticipated, they think about it and actually say something about it. That's what I would look for in a candidate. Any thoughts on what might be uh, <clears throat> the salient issues in the 2008 presidential campaign? Well, clearly Iraq is, is for policy is going to be a salient issue, uh, unavoidably, and so is the war on terrorism. Uh, I suspect that this will be one of those rare campaigns where the domestic economy will play a very small part. Uh, where, of course, things like reforming Social Security, reforming health care, all of these things will come up, but they will not play uh, center stage. And I see nobody among the current crop of candidates whom I would describe as heresthetic. These are all uh, rhetorical campaigners. I see nobody who is an innovator. Um, they, they range from, you know, we have to do what we're doing because surely if, we, uh, we're doing, if we're doing this, it must be that it's the best thing to be doing, to I'm in favor of hope. I would really like things to be good, uh, and, and I promise you I will, be, I will make things good. You know, these vague statements. I, I, there's nobody out there with ideas. There's a lot of complaints about Iraq. I hear nothing that is concrete about why should we, so let's suppose we withdraw. Why should we expect the consequences for the United States as a foreign power in the long term are better by withdrawing or are better by staying in? There's no, there's just, there's, there's just assertion. There is no reasoned do think, argument. Do you think that might change, though, as the competitive uh, heat of the battle? Oh, no, 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 no. Quite the contrary. It will become vaguer and vaguer as, the, as people get closer. So candidates who stake out a clear position will be defeated. But if you're about to lose, it reminds me of when students submit their uh, essays for, for graduate school, particularly law school. The essays were all the same. It's about how the essay writer survived a personal tragedy. Uh, I always tell them, take a chance. Do something a little different. Uh, put something in your resume that's a little bit different. Oh, yeah, people who are about to go down will undoubtedly try to resurrect themselves by taking chances. The nature of high risks is that usually they fail. That's why they're high risks. In closing, do you want to say something about William Riker? We've talked to, you opened this podcast by talking about his distinction between rhetorical and heresthetic campaigns, heresthetic being a word he coined for the type of innovation we're talking about. He may be a name that some of our listeners aren't aware of. Uh, talk, tell us about uh, his work and his influence uh, on you. William Riker, who passed away nine years ago, was a member of the, uh, one of the first political scientists ever elected to the National Academy of Science, uh, was what I would describe as a once in a century man. Um, he reinvented how politics is studied. He is the originator uh, of uh, the serious mathematical study of politics, particularly through uh, game theory. Uh, I consider him to have been perhaps the most innovative and original political thinker since uh, Niccolò Machiavelli. Uh, he's, he, he was a, a remarkable uh, figure who, both through his work and his teaching, uh, transformed how, we, uh, how many of us think about politics. Uh, he is somebody that people should read. He wrote a wonderful little book, completely non-technical, 
called uh, The Art of Political Manipulation, uh, which is a set of uh, historical narratives explaining how particular uh, politicians made themselves successful. Those are some wonderful accounts of uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's cleverness, for example. He wrote uh, a, a, a book called Liberalism Against Populism, which I think for anybody who wants a fundamental understanding of politics is a must read. It's a, it's a little bit of technical material, though not hard, um, in, in which he explains why it is that the best that we can hope for from democracy is to make an, a system that makes it easy to throw the rascals out. Uh, it's just a, he's a very, very clever man, and certainly nothing that I have done in my career could I have done without having known William Riker. I think you told me that if there were a political science, if there were a Nobel Prize in political science, he would have gotten the first one. Yes, and absolutely should have. Uh, he should have won the Nobel Prize. There were some non-political scientists who have won it. Obviously, there'd be non-economists who have won it. Right, true. Uh, and yeah, not many, been, but it, it, he should have been one of them. My guest today has been Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Silver Professor of Politics at New York University. Thanks for being here, Bruce. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.